welcome everyone. I am very honored today to have with me a new woman in IT um, who I'm going to talk to today. Her name is Krista Vino. She works at VMware at the moment as a solutions engineer in the hyperconverged infrastructure BU which is business unit, maybe I should explain that. Uh, we always tend to use a lot of slang in IT. <laughs> so for our viewers, this is the business unit. So hi, Christelle, nice to have you here. Hi, Ronke, thank you for having me. <laughs> so Christelle, um, you are a solution engineer like I am, also a specialist um, uh, in another business unit working on another product. Um, but before we talk about the product and the company, let's talk a little bit about yourself. I'm really, really interested in understanding how you became a woman in technology. <laughs> sure. Um, big question to start. <laughs> so how I became a, a woman in tech, I think it all started with the influence of my father uh, also being in tech. Mm -hmm. And when I was three year old, I remember he was already teaching me all sort of things in tech, showing me how computers work. Uh, we would basically dismantle all sort of things, calculator, computer, TV, um, maybe after three years old, right? <laughs> it started at three, but I think we started dismantling things maybe when I was six years old. So uh, I quickly got an interest in, uh, in tech and how things work in details uh, if I look at a picture, if I see something, I want to know how it's how it works behind the scenes. Um, that's what my father kind of uh, kind of told me very early. Be interested. Don't just look at the, the face of the moon. Have a, understand what's behind as well, because there is something behind as well. So it all came from my father. He's responsible for me being in IT, whether it's a good thing or not. <laughs> And, um, and then later on at school, I studied uh, electronics. So uh, I took an electronics field, found myself with uh, a lot of men, all of us students. I think it were, it was only, we were only two girls at the time um, <laughs> uh, with uh, maybe 30 men uh, in the same classroom. So it was a weird experience, but anyway, I was on my, on my IT journey. And then I studied um, engineering uh, after that, got an en engineering background in, in networking. Um, and then, yeah, ended up in uh, working for tech companies and now VMware. Okay, question. So you say you, you went to school in an engineering school and there were two girls and 30 boys. How did, how did you feel in that environment? Let's dig a little bit into that question. Um, yeah, in my engineering school, actually, it was even worse than that. I think we were three girls and maybe 60 men, something like this. So uh, it was even worse. But um, honestly, it was fine. Uh, I had really good relationships with, uh, with my, um, my classmates. Mm -hmm. um, I had my own group of boys. It's not like we girls would just stick to each other and, you know, have our own ladies group I had my group of boys they had their group of boys and so on and uh and things were great honestly um and I always got along with men um since a very young age um most of my friends are are, are men and um it was never an issue from that, that perspective there had been some challenges sometimes with men who have difficulties to build relationships with women <laughs> and vice versa um but it's never been an issue, I would say. <laughs> well, that's, I, I love that you're telling me this because my last interview was with uh, Naomi Betts. She's an account executive in Germany. And she told me something very similar about her studies because she um, com studied computer science and it was also mostly men. But what she told me was that she felt really good there and that she had really good relationship, built very deep friendships and she didn't have an issue um, either. So I feel this is a very important study Thing to emphasize because a lot of women don't go into these fields because they feel they will be alone or maybe just a few women with a lot of men and they might feel uncomfortable so hearing that you and Naomi as well felt really good about the whole thing and it wasn't an issue is I think a very important thing now de definitely and um and to be honest um the funny thing is that women are quite um they, they have their own territories and when another, when another woman comes around, there is sometimes some kind of competition between women. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that in other fields, like marketing fields and so on. 
I would have some women friends out there and they would tell me how competitive it would be to have so many women around. Mm -hmm. And um, what I don't get that because I've never been exposed to that many women at school or even at work, I tend to work mostly with men. I get it, Mm -hmm. but we don't have that with, with men. Men are actually protective. So for example, I was never in trouble, that kind of stuff, but I was also protective with them Mm -hmm. and um and I think that's probably where we're kind of lacking or maybe we're a bit behind women because we're not as supportive as men are for each other like men men are like brothers for each other that's the way I look at it women are kind of protective and defensive of their territory Mm -hmm. and um and I would like to go beyond that, even at work or even in my relationship with women, I try to establish straight away there's no competition between us. We're our sisters. I get what you're saying. And I've heard this uh, from time to time. I try to surround myself with women who are actually really supportive. And I feel um, when I now look out uh, into the field, especially in IT, maybe it's the women who go into IT, I don't know, but I have met so many encouraging women. And all of the women I have met also in the recent month, in recent month where I have been doing this vlog have been women who really try to lift each other up. Yeah. So this is a very, very nice thing to see. So personally, like you, I have most of my life, I've been working with men, so I have no immediate experience <laughs> either. Um, but I can say that the women I meet in this field in, in uh, technology are terribly supportive. And I think that's an important point um, that we, maybe it's also because we, um, there's not so many of us, so we try to, to you know, support each other more. That could be a, a point, you know. Yeah, no, I, I've seen that uh, at VMware as well, and also at, at, at Dell. I've come from Dell EMC before, and I've seen that that we're not many women, but there's definitely some sort of community between us. Like we have our back. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least with, with the, the ones I've, I've worked with or I've built relationships with, we do have our back, and, and this is really great. And just just to give an example, I've announced at VMware that this year I'm going to change job. I'm going to be doing something else because I've been doing the same kind of job for four years. And I said, I want to see something else, which I think it's a natural path for my career. Mm-hmm. And this morning I got a, I got a, a Slack from uh, w- one of our ladies and she said, hey, Crystal, I just, I just saw a job advertised and, uh, and I think you'd be amazing for this. I said, you know what, lady, you have my back. I love that. Just that text this morning, it made my day. Just these little things that actually enhance my experience as a human being working for a large organization at VMware, where we, in the middle of a pandemic, sometimes we, we feel like we're numbers, we, we've kind of lost a bit of humanity in ourselves, but these tiny things, it just, it, yeah, it's it's a bit things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. love that story. And that's also my experience. Um, and coming back to having your back, actually, I feel that one of the persons or people in your life who has had your back is your dad right because um, you told me how he um, made you uh, interested in IT how he showed you things how things work that uh, makes me want to ask a few more questions about your dad if that's okay yes although (laughs) we're no longer in touch so uh okay (laughs) Oh yeah, so so my, my parents separated when I was eight years old. Yeah. Oh, I so, see. um yeah, I got the momentum, the uh, the tech momentum, uh, mm-hmm. and I kept it, and I'm still in tech, which is great. Mm-hmm. Although um my my mom's done the most of it. She is the person behind who I am today, the mm-hmm. grit that I have, the motivation, being determined in everything I do. That's definitely my mom. My my dad put me on track to do tech. Mm-hmm. And my mom did the okay, rest. Okay, so actually your dad was the one who triggered it, but your mom was the one who had your back, which is another woman who supported you. That's Amazing. also great. Um, <laughs> so in terms of family, do you have siblings? Um, no, okay. So because actually my question was going less into the direction of your dad, but more into the question if there was a difference between your brothers and yourself or something like that. But obviously um, you, that's not a oh, question me. you can answer. <laughs> So coming back to your life, so you went to an engineering school and then you studied networking, but um, I think you also, not only uh, did you um, study, I think you also switched countries where you live, right? So you are initially from France. Indeed, yes. I I grew up in in Paris, in the suburb of Paris, and and I studied in Paris. 
And then um, <laughs> the funny thing is that at school, I realized that a lot of the paperwork we were asked to work with was written in English. Because <laughs> that's how most of the technical documentation are written. They're all in English. And English, well, I was terrible at speaking English, by the way. I was terrible at languages. And, um, and at school, even to get our diploma, we had to take a test called the TOEIC. And we had to pass with a certain uh, a minimum score, was, which was 750 at the time. And I think they raised it after I left. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm glad they raised it after I left, by the way, because I got just 750 or 752 when I passed it. So just the bare minimum. I was so bad uh, in, in English that I thought if I really want to go big in tech and build a career that I'm, that I'm looking forward to, to have, I need to be fluent in English. And if I stay in France, if I stay in Paris, in my nice bubble, in my comfort zone with my family and friends, I will never be able to be fluent in English. I will never be able to build a career that I know I'm going to have to build. And I decided to leave France and I went to language school for nine months. It was a nine month program in London. I really wanted to be in London because I thought if I have to go somewhere, I have to go somewhere nice at least to speak English. So I thought London would be a good destination also it's only two hours away from Paris so I knew that I could come back once in a while to see my family if I was missing them uh, if I was missing my mom in particular so um so I went for this program for nine months and um quickly I realized how expensive the city was I, I have to say that London is a bloody expensive city <laughs> but after six months um I realized that my English still wasn't that great. I got the basics, I got the grammar, I did the structure, I could introduce myself, say a few things, but definitely that wasn't enough to, to find a job, for example, or to settle down in the UK. So I thought, okay, Crystal, you got three months left, you can't speak English still, and you're gonna come back to France and you're gonna go back to your previous life, get a job, speak French, and that's it. And I thought this is going to be a failure, not only because I will have paid for that school, I will have spent nine months in the UK learning basic English, and I'm going to forget all of that once I'll be back in the UK and I'll have lost the money. So I thought I can't just go back. I have to do something else. So I looked at my options and um, in France, we've, there are some um, a program where basically you can work for a French company implemented um, in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a website for that. So I went to that website and I looked at the different job opportunities and I found a job um, in, a, in an aerospace company called CETA. Mm -hmm. um, and they were hiring for some sort of intern. It's, it's kind of internship, basically. But you do the job just like um, anyone else, but it's sort of internship from a contract perspective. Mm -hmm. And they hired me as a cloud architect. I had zero experience in doing cloud architecture. I just went for an interview and I said, guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, I've got zero experience in cloud architecture, but I've been studying in my bedroom uh, for the last X month and I've been training speaking English and I'm not still fluent, but I don't wanna go back to France and I'm determined and I want this job and, and I know I can be great for you. And they said, so you've been training on what? Tell us. And I told them about the VMware labs that I built in my bedroom, the vSphere. And at the time it was vSphere, vCloud director, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and they loved that. They thought, okay, we got someone motivated here. And, um, and I got the job. So I could stay one more year in the UK. At least I knew I had one more year secured in the UK. And I got exposed to British people speaking English, working in English. I got exposed to a lot of French people, so I could speak French. That was good. I wasn't required to be fluent in English, but at least I was at the right place to, um, to learn, to learn a lot and to improve my English. And then, yeah, <laughs> that was my yeah. first job. I wouldn't be able to tell because your English is so good now that, um, how, that I have to ask, how long have you been in the UK? Uh, in September, it's going to be eight years. Okay. So it, it's been a while. <laughs> you were telling me that your English was not good. And, and I was thinking, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, been, it's been almost seven, uh, eight years. So uh, it, it's yeah. been a while. It, it, yeah. <laughs> if you had known me eight years ago, you, you'd be thinking, what the hell is she doing in the UK? <laughs> Get trying, get trying, girl. 
No, but that, but this is such an amazing story. You do, took such a big step there. You just decided to go to a place. Did you know anyone in London really when you decided to go? So you just packed up, mm. went because you were sure that this was uh, something where you could build your life. I mean, London is not an easy city, right? Um, it's a big city. There's a lot of people. You know nobody. It's expensive, as you said. And you, pff, wow, I, I am amazed. I must say that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, no, I did not know anyone, um, but it, it was so close to Paris that I just saw it as an extension of Paris. You know, there's a 21 arrondissement in, in Paris. I thought this, this was just a 22nd. <laughs> it's just two hours away. Uh, it, it needs, it, it needs a t an expensive ticket to get there, but it's just like going to uh, Lyon, for example, which is also two hours away from Paris. It's just a city that is two hours away from Paris and the people speak a different language. So I didn't see it as, as a huge risk, although a lot of people tell me, um, Krista, you know, you took a big risk when you do, when you did that. I don't see it this way. I see it as, um, I had the money to go there because I had saved a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the money to, 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 to go there. It was a school, so I wasn't just randomly going around in, in, in London and trying to figure out things. I had a plan. Everything was structured. Uh, I was, uh, I, I was um, in a language school, and they put me in, um, I don't know how you call that, um, oh, uh, host families. Oh, yeah, host family. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so, so basically, they, they put me with these host families, and uh, they took care of me. They fed me, so... I wasn't in danger or in any kind of tricky situation, right? Everything was planned and went, didn't go according to the plan because after six months, I still couldn't speak English. I thought I would be fluent and I had big dreams. I thought I would be fluent and I was not, but it was always a plan. And I think it's super important to always plan everything you do and have plan B, plan C <laughs> because things don't go as planned. So, uh, but it's important <laughs> to plan ahead, no matter what. <laughs> interesting thing you know uh, that you say you didn't feel you take risks I do feel understand that because I did similar things for example I went for a job to Munich I had never been to Munich it's uh, and I didn't know anyone and I didn't even try it out before I took the job I just thought the same it's not far away from Vienna it's only a few hours per train if I don't like it I can go back I had this job and all the rest was like okay it'll work out it's not like it didn't feel like a big adventure at the time, but it probably was because it was actually really leaving your entire comfort zone, the people you know, your family, everything, and just going somewhere, you know? And most people don't do that. And even if sure. you don't feel like it, I, I can see that this was a big step. And obviously it changed your life a lot because yeah. now, eight years later, you are like an experienced solutions engineer in one of the biggest, and it's actually one of the biggest, it's in, in, in rank six of all software companies. And that's where you're working. That's a very big step. Yes. So obviously it was the right decision, no? Yes, I, if I had to do it again, I would do it again, definitely. I wouldn't do anything different. I would tweak a few things, but I wouldn't do anything different. And, and I highly encourage anyone who wants to go abroad when, we, when they can, because right now it's not maybe the, the best time, but yeah. when things will go back to, to normal, I, I highly encourage, um, it doesn't matter how people are, but I highly encourage anyone mm. to do it, at least just to just to set some goals. Like, yeah. I'm yeah. do it for six months. I'm going to go away for six months, see if it works out. Have a plan, first thing, have a plan. Mm. Um, but set goals, six months. If it doesn't work after six months, then what's my exit strategy? Am I going back to where I was before? Or am I going to try something different? Have a plan B and C and, and maybe D, but don't, don't too many plans can ruin the plan. But uh, I would highly recommend to anyone to do it, to experience it, at least just for the sake of not having regrets, because I think this is the worst thing in life. And it's, it's basically waking up in the morning and think about all the things that we thought we should have done and we never took the opportunity to do just because we were scared. Yeah. I think it's worse to wake up with regrets than experiencing or fear of fear. Yeah. So um. it's an interesting point you're making because I talked to someone today and one of the things I said was that I believe that growth only happens where you experience a little fear. You know, it's always that, you know, at this edge of your comfort zone where you grow. So coming to growth, do you 
do you experience did you experience that that you grew as a person uh, throughout this journey uh, yes a, a lot and if you speak to someone who knew me before I came to London and someone who knows me today they will describe two different people mm -hmm. completely two different people um when I, when I was in Paris I was a student I mean I had less experience and, and so on but uh I, I wasn't connecting well with people. I wasn't keen to get to know people at a very personal level and create meaningful relationship with people. I was in my bubble. It was all about my study, get my degree and get a job and, and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And now, eight years later, and maybe because, um, because London, the culture in London is basically to create relationships with a lot of people everything is moving super fast people are so friendly here that's the I love London for that now it's a bit difficult because everyone is is at home but London has so much energy as a city and people are just so friendly I can be in a pub for example or in a coffee place and just have a random chat with someone I've never met before in Paris I would have never done that and in Paris if, if someone would talk to me I'd be like do you have a problem or is there, is there anything wrong or do you have a reason to talk to me by the way things are you need help <laughs> you need, yeah are you lost or do you realize you're talking to me <laughs> so people need to have a reason to talk to each other in in Paris that's how I experienced it back in my days when I was in Paris in London people will need to have a reason people are just having a good time and if they feel like they could have a good chat with someone right to them or on the left it's possible and that really opened my mind up mm -hmm. and changed the way I build relationships with people I I'm, I'm super super grateful for everything that the city brought to me and, and helped me to grow from that perspective mm -hmm. so um so definitely from a, from from if I look at the growth and the things that I've learned in the city is connecting with people mm -hmm. at a more personal level now the counter argument to that is that <laughs> You can meet people in pubs, you can meet people in plenty of places, doesn't mean they're going to become your friends forever. We can have a good chat today, doesn't mean tomorrow we're going to stay in touch. And that's the counter argument. That's where sometimes I wish, you know, I could build even better relationships with people, but it's, London isn't really like that. Yeah. But at least I got to build my relationships with people and, and I'm super grateful for that. <laughs> I think the, uh, what you just uh, talked about is maybe an issue of bigger cities where you meet people, you talk to them, and then, you know, you just drift apart because there are so many relations that you have every day. So um, I don't think it has anything to do with your ability to communicate. I think you you have learned communicating very well. And I also think that something communication skills is something that is helping you with your career, right? I mean, we work with customers all the time. And I think communication is one of the, the big pillars on which our, um, our whole job rests, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot. Yeah. And I mean, with that pandemic, the fact that we cannot see customers face to face mm -hmm. from a non-native, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm French, right? So mm -hmm. when I communicate with British people or Italians or French or whoever, pe Germans, whoever people are from, the body language was a huge asset for me because mm -hmm. I could rely on that if I wouldn't understand something, for example, um, I could connect with people. Um, for example, if I explain a concept, I talk about cloud foundation, for example, Visa and all those sort of things, and someone doesn't get it, if I don't see the, the person I'm talking to, if I don't see the body language, someone throwing the eyebrows or reacting strangely, I, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. I can just pose and, and ask, okay, obviously there was something you didn't understand or, Maybe we need to deep dive in that concept. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that have been taken away from me and from all people like me who are trying to, to enhance communication with others. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm really I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that we get back to normal as soon as possible because I am deeply missing these tiny things of the body language and uh, and the chemistry that that's that you feel from from the people you interact with. There's also some sort of chemistry that. 
I think think is essential. It's an uh, an exchange of energy, actually, when you're in the room with people. And um, you touched on a very important um, aspect of our job is actually the way we connect with people when we're in the room with them, how we explain what we do and and how this uh, feedback is important for what we do. Um, So since we're talking about the different roles in in IT uh, in this this spotlight, maybe you want to touch a little bit more on what you do on a day-to-day basis. I mean, not necessarily now, where we are all sitting and working from home <laughs> but what are the different aspects of being a solution engineer yeah so the the, the things that i do um so I, I'm, I'm pre-sales so i'm a solution architect as part of the pre-sales um team so i belong to a sales organization overall and my job is to explain technical concepts about a specific technology to customers so i focus on software defined data centers um, and my role is really to enable customers to understand the concepts of software data uh, centers and how they can quickly adopt these technologies and also explain the benefits of adopting this sort of, of, of technology. Um, so mo- most of my uh, days are consist in well, a mix of a lot of things, meeting with customers, first of all, explaining technologies, teaching, ev- uh, evangelizing about the technology. Um, working towards uh, requests for proposals where customers go to market and they say, we're looking for a solution and my role will be to design that solution um, and position it as the right solution for them and technically supports uh, the technical explanation around why that solution makes sense for the organization, what are the benefits that it's going to bring to the organization, how is that going to help them free up their time to focus more on the business as opposed to uh, the maintenance, the, um, the nitty gritty, you know, patching, upgrading, all that kind of stuff, how we can take most of the pain away mm-hmm. around uh, the infrastructure and enable them to do uh, cooler things. So um, that, that, that's also an aspect of my job, um, post sales as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would love to think that we sell a technology and it works absolutely great, you know, and never breaks and so on. Sometimes yeah. it can break its, its technology, you know, it's... Uh, um, you know, it, it, it breaks <laughs> once again. So, um, so my role is to be there with, with the customers and to ensure I'm a point of contact, to guide them to to support, ensure that they they have what they need um, from their perspective. And and sometimes it requires support from the, the, the salespeople. Um, that's typically when things go really wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen often, but it's also part of the job. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, and um, and something that I started to do uh, more and more um, following the, 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 the pandemic is um, doing coaching internally within the company. So uh, basically explaining concepts of vSAN, for example, to people who have just joined VMware, for example, um, or coaching around um, going through difficult moments. It's, I wouldn't say that I can coach people on being good leaders or, or being a better person, but giving tips on what I've learned in life, what that I've learned that helped me to be a better person at my perspective, because maybe what I've learned can help someone else. So, um, so having this kind of random conversations with people internally, mainly with women, I, I have to say, um, is something that I increase doing um, following the, the start of the pandemic. Actually, that's something um, I have a colleague here in Austria that you are currently helping a lot. And I want to thank you for that because she is so happy with the job you're doing and you're such a great support to her. So yeah, that, that I think this is an aspect of our job that often doesn't have enough uh, space and, and time because we have work so much much with customer but this internal support is something very very important mm-hmm. and um, yeah I, I got such good feedback on that thank you so, it's good to know <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's good to know thank you so there are different aspects there's the external and there's the internal um, aspect uh, usually when there's no pandemic we are more outward facing I guess and um, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, things in your job that you really enjoy doing so I, I can feel that you really enjoy working with customers 
from what you said earlier, I, I hear that you enjoy being in a room with people, exchanging ideas and, and explaining things. So that, that is something you're really good at. But I think you yourself, um, even though you're here in VMware, you're pre-sales, you are also an entrepreneur, no? You have your own company, right? I think you sell Japanese teas. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's still new. I mean, yeah, it's going to be one year uh, in April. So, um, so yes, last year, January 2020, I had the idea of creating my own company. Mm -hmm. And I started to send a few emails to suppliers in Japan to sell organic Japanese tea in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I remember it, it was the first obstacle when I sent the, uh, those emails to suppliers um, uh, and to, um, to, to, sorry, to suppliers in, in Japan. Um, their first answer was, are you a registered business, by the way? Who mm -hmm. are you? And you're talking to us as if you can talk to anyone. <laughs> Who are you? Are you a business? Are you certified? Are you licensed? Do you have the right to import organic Japanese tea in the UK? Tell us a bit more about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was no one. Mm -hmm. I had no company created. I was just interested to know about the process, first of all. And when I realized that I had to meet a number of criteria before I could talk to them, um, so as um, I started to work with uh, DEFRA, the, De the Department for Rural and Rural Affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, so they regulate basically the way um, companies uh, import, for example, products, food from um, uh, overseas into the UK, for example. Um, and they really helped me understanding what I needed to have as a business. Um, to, to import organic products in the UK because there's, there's a lot of regulation around that. We can't just say I've imported a product, it's organic and I'm going to sell it and call it organic. So there's a lot of stuff to, to, to know about it and they took the time to explain me how things work and so on and so um, they've been super helpful. They, they told me what I needed to, to do to set up a company and to import organic products in the UK and I started trading uh, in April mm -hmm. 2020 one month after the lockdown was announced and so on so it wasn't the best time but I mean who cares I was new so uh so I thought you know what it can only get better <laughs> um and and then a few months later I started to sell my products on Amazon as well um just to take care of the load and for their customer service at least if something goes wrong Amazon have an ex excellent customer service so now um, they handle my inventory, uh, which is great. They, they ship for me. They take care of the customer feedback, um, customer support. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have to take care of the website. So that, that's great. And the legals. So uh, at least they, they do quite a lot for me. Right, that takes a lot of, of your back. All the logistics and all that um, are handled by someone else because that's usually the most difficult part when you're talking about shipping things and, and, oh. uh, and yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, 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 I'll, I'll spare you the the, the, the details, but uh, the first month were the, maybe the hardest of, of my journey. Uh, I would say that, and, and it's been a journey. But planting the seeds and wait to see the first leaf coming out <laughs> that that took a village. It mm -hmm. took a lot of time because creating a business requires so many skills in terms of designing for example mm -hmm. um, sales I had it but I can't say it's comparable to selling something at VMware uh, for example it's not selling technology it's about selling foods so it's a different skill set to have um, marketing as well how to market the products social media for example creates good content mm -hmm. so that customers get attracted and and get an interest in the company creating a value around the company um, I had to create my own values for people to identify to these values mm -hmm. and buy not what I do, but why I do it. And I'm taking that from Simon Sinek, who I really like. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and so, so I, without any experience, I could only basically rely on the stuff I had seen here and here and, here mm -hmm. <laughs> and try to put that all together. And, and it might sound like it, it was an easy journey. Oh no, <laughs> it, it's, still, it's still a journey. And th the hardest thing is that when there was an obstacle, 
we know that it's just an obstacle hiding plenty of other obstacles. There are so many and there are still many obstacles. And as the business is growing, there are more obstacles going, uh, coming up. And, um, and this is where I really got to understand more about myself. I really got to connect with myself and understand who understood who I was, because it's only when we found ourselves and from my own experience, it's only when I found myself deep down crying in front of Photoshop, which is an awful tool to use, by the way, if you don't have any experience. Very true. Working on the labels, thinking what good looks like, first of all, how do I put a label together? Is that going, are my customers actually, uh, actually going to like it? What do I have to put inside? There are regulations in the UK in regards to what I can write or not on a label. Mm-hmm. What about the dimensions? If, if it's printed out, is that going to crop out some stuff or is everything going to be in the design? And I remember myself crying in front of Photoshop thinking, this is just too hard. Maybe I should just pay someone to do it. Mm-hmm. But paying some, someone to do something that you don't have any expectations of is just giving money away because people will come back saying, Here's, here you go. And then you don't know what it looks like. So I thought, let's, let's suffer a little bit. It's, it was never meant to be an easy journey. I knew it was going to be hard, but I've got the passion. And as long as I have the passion, I can do anything. I'm unstoppable. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so, so the passion kept me going. It was like fuel. And every time I was crying, I, remind my, I reminded myself of the, fu- the future and the goal I was, I was aiming for. And thinking of that goal, thinking of the fact that the journey is long and it's normal and it's okay to cry helped me uh, help me to keep going. So um, so yeah, and, and, and here I am today. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and I would say things I'm, I'm not I'm not pocketing millions every month. I know that's the first question that people want to ask me, but they don't know how to ask me uh, outside is how much you make, how much is this business making your crystal? It's not about that. I, I don't care about that. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing it because I love the product and I want to share it with the world. Mm-hmm. If you want to see how much I'm making, it's public. People can find it. It's, it's on the internet. I'm, I'm sharing my numbers and mm-hmm. indirectly, but basically every time I sell a product, I plant a tree. Mm-hmm. And it's part of the value of the company. We have to give back. We, to give back, we take something from Earth, we take the plants, we turn it into tea, we sell it to people. We have to give back to planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And we, um, we uh, uh, create CO2 emissions as the product is traveling from Japan to the customer. We offset that CO2. So customers can actually have the possibility to plant trees mm-hmm. every time they buy a product. And wow. everybody can see my, 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 my forest. I'm growing a forest. So by the number of products that I've sold, people can see it turns into a number of trees. So people can see the number of products I'm selling and can kind of calculate how much I'm making if they're really interested into that. But um, <laughs> but I feel that you're more into it because of the passion. I mean, it's the, the passion to yes. talk with, uh, again, uh, stress Simon Sinek, start with the why. And I think yes. you know why you're doing this. And it's obviously not because you want to make buckets of money. And I think also <laughs> thinking about the money you can make is usually the wrong approach because as you said, the road to the goal you're heading to is full of obstacles. And uh, the scary thing you said was behind every obstacle, there are more obstacles. No more. Um, yeah, most people don't realize that. They just see the goal and they neglect to think about what it will cost them to reach that goal. So there must be something driving you. And I think uh, with you, it's the passion that you have for what you're doing. And that's, uh, I think, what makes people do great things, passion, not money. Definitely. Even though it looks like it was about the money or something, it isn't. De- de- definitely. The money is just some sort of reward. It's one of the rewards. Mm-hmm. I think the best rewards, from my perspective, is to see happy customers. Mm-hmm. When I have people reaching out to me just randomly and telling me what you're doing is great, I'm thinking this is the best reward to know that someone has taken two minutes of their lives, mm-hmm. which they will never get back, just to tell me that what, what, what I was doing was great. This is, this is a, a, the, the best reward that someone as a sole owner of a company can get, just having this positive feedback from customers. Because sometimes there are days where I, I just want to stop everything. Like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> it's, this is too hard. Or, but thinking of the customers really helps me to, 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 to keep going. Uh, honestly because now that the business is running 
now I, I'm in a maintaining phase. I have to grow it, but I have to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Building it, it's kind of done. But now it's in the maintaining phase. And the maintaining phase isn't the funniest part, I have to say. But Amazon, Amazon does a lot. I'm grateful Amazon is helping me. But now I have to maintain. And a lot of the cool parts is kind of gone. Like, I'm talk I was talking building about the new stuff, the doing something you haven't done before. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that, yes, I'm going to do a marketing campaign. Oh, that's great. It's going to be hard, but it's great because I'm going to learn how to do marketing, for example. Or legals is never fun. I have to say legals is never, ever fun. Mm -hmm. But there's other stuff like, oh, I'm going to create this label. I'm going to fight with Photoshop. Yes, but at the end, when you think about it, I'm going to have a new level. It's going to be shiny. It's going to be beautiful. And I will I will have made this myself. And it's great. I, I will have learned some, done something. So um, <laughs> I see you creating well, something very new in the near future. <laughs> but I think you have the spirit. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, Go, go, going back to, um, to, to, to what we were talking about uh, before, it's all down to the passion for mm -hmm. first and, and foremost. And then comes the rewards. And the rewards, people can see rewards in different ways. Money, customer satisfaction, ego sometimes. Um, but from my perspective, it's, it's what the customers give me as, as feedback. Um, and when... I mean, maybe, maybe I'm going a bit too far here, but uh, I've got an Instagram page and I've got customers doing recipes and all kinds of stuff with the tea and, and they tag me and they, they create stories and so on. And, and I see the effort that they put in. Now, obviously, the effort is also towards building their own brands on the Internet. But the fact that they have considered working with my products to grow themselves and to grow their brands. It's it is an amazing deal of approval, approval, right? So it, it tells you that what you created is a great thing because yeah. people want to use it. Yeah, That's exactly. Great. And yeah, and there's competition. They could have gone to some, someone else, but they go to me because they love the idea of giving back to Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about climate change and a lot of people deny it. A lot of people agree with it. But mm -hmm. what can we do? What well, is tiny things buying from responsible businesses mm -hmm. is a way to act, is a way to share our voice to share our opinion and and i really want to encourage people to not support my business in particular because i'm, I'm just selling japanese tea i'm not changing the world but encouraging people to buy from responsible businesses that care about the planet is a first step if you want to make a difference yeah i agree with you so there is i think um we as a cons consumers have a choice to make how we spend our money and where in which um, direction we want the world to go so yeah, you're right. We can choose to buy from companies like yours or similar companies. That's true. Yeah. So I feel that in the, your story, there's so many um, different growth points. So there's the growth you experienced by going to UK. There's another growth spurt, as I might say, by uh, creating your new, your company. And I wonder what your ne next one will be really, because I think uh, there are still great things ahead. Changing, or, job. changing job is, uh, yeah. is my goal. right uh, changing more. jobs yeah you mentioned that you're going to change a job and i'm sure that will trigger another growth in yourself so um but for those who are not yet there who are starting out young girls young women who are looking for a career is there something you would recommend i mean you recommended obviously going abroad and and living abroad as a as a way to to grow but what else would you recommend <laughs> Uh, what I would recommend would actually be for anyone, um, not just for the young people, because I, I don't want to imply that after a certain age, things are over. I'm a strong believer that even at, after 50 years old, 70 years old, you can always achieve a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, even starting a career, for example, it will be difficult, but with a bit of creativity, we, we can get things done. And the right people to support, of course. Important to have the right people around. But my best advice would be to never look at the limits that are in front of you, the obstacles that are in front of you, because obstacles and, and will be everywhere and the limits will be everywhere as well. And that if the limits are not visible, sometimes people will put limits in front of you. People will tell you, you know what, if, if you want to do this in your life, it's going to be hard. They will... It will take grades, it will take days, it will take that. It will discourage you, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, there are people, I call them the crabs. 
uh, they are just here to to pinch you and hold you back. You know, it's a, we don't want them in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm thinking of some people I have still in my life who life who are crabs. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to not listen to them. The only person you can listen to is yourself and the people that you trust who you know want good things for you. Mm -hmm. And as long as you surround yourself with these people, know that you are limitless. There is no obstacle that are too great for you. You can do everything. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that's the way I look at it. And sometimes it can sound a bit stupid just to pose and, and think I can do anything, I can do anything. It doesn't come instantly. You have to train your mind the, 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 and, and the brain. The brain is a muscle. You have to train it and tell it constantly that you are limitless. If you want to achieve something in life, it's down to you. You're going to need help from people, definitely, because there's no success that you can achieve on your own. The success is always the combination of efforts from multiple people mm -hmm. that contributes to your success and to their success as well, hopefully. Um, but it's, it's, it's down to you to train yourself, to condition yourself to be that person, to be who you want to be. And I'm saying that because following that pandemic, a lot of us have spent more time on social media, mm -hmm. comparing ourselves to other people on social media, and everybody looks so great on social media. They're all having this fantastic life. Mm -hmm. This is what they want us to see. And it can, it can make us feel bad. Like, oh, this person's got this amazing house or passed this certification. And so we don't know how bad it looks behind the social media. We, we can't look, you know, look under the cover and see. We don't do what's going on under the roof. Yeah. All we see is the, the nice social media page that people are good at creating. And that's also something I got from... Uh, Simon uh, uh, Sinek mm -hmm. so um, I would say surround yourself with the right people and train yourself to think positively and yeah. don't compare yourself with others and the more you train your mind the more you tell yourself that you're limitless the more you tweak your habits to empower yourself the more you're going to do great things mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 yeah I mean that's it sounds like a very like simple advice but you can't, you can't be Michelle Obama in 24 hours, for example. Yeah. It's a journey. And she talks about it in Becoming. It's a journey. But it, it's a lot of tiny things you have to do every day and stick to a routine mm -hmm. to get to where you want to be. If you want to be an astronaut, an architect at VMware or whatever, nothing can stop you doing that. The only person that can stop you doing that is yourself focusing on the obstacles. But yeah. there are no obstacles if you decide to not see them or to, or if you decide that they are just temporary mm -hmm. obstacles, they're just going to go away. Only you can make them go away. <laughs> Thank you. That's, I think that that's so many important things you just said. I, I, I don't even know how to, to bring them together because there's all these things that, that I really, no, no, it's, it's actually a lot of stuff that's so true. Don't limit yourself, I think, is one of the most important things. Don't focus on the obstacle. Yeah, and the others. And surround yourself with people who are supportive. <laughs> so on that note, thank you, Christelle. This was a great interview. Thank, thank you. you for coming on my show, as I call it. And um, good luck with your business and also good luck with your job change. I look forward to seeing what you will be doing, really. Uh, and, 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 and Ronke, thank you so much for doing this, this vlogs, this series of vlogs, because... It gets to, to highlight a lot of women that I didn't know before and I got to know through this vlog. And I thank you so much for doing this. It's the first time I got to be interviewed for a, a company and I'm so glad it didn't come from marketing. It came from <laughs> a peers, someone like you. We, we do the same type of job. So I'm really glad that it was led by you and, uh, and I'm really, really uh, wishing you good luck for the rest and I look forward to the, the next videos. Thank you, Christelle. Thanks.